Hi, this is Brad from Pro Wrestling Junkies, and welcome to another episode of Toilet Side Wrestling Talk. Today's guest is from Tulsa and began wrestling in 2016. Trained under Merrick Brave and someone named Seth Rollins and has worked for such promotions as Central Empire Wrestling, 3XW, SCW Pro, now this is wrestling, Zawa, and in 2019 worked a Monday Night Raw match against Eric Rowan. He's the current, the current 3XW Pure Champion as well as the current CEW, CEW Champion. He shared the ring with the likes of Heather Reckless, Donnie Pepper Cricket, Latin Thunder, Robin Steele, Rory Fox, Jerry Lawler, to name a few. So please, let's welcome today's guest, wrestler, DJ, choreographer, dancer, someone who's better at all those things and probably a lot more, according to my wife, the six-star booty, JT Energy. JT, how are you? I'm great. What an introduction. That's, I, my, that's my favorite part of a lot of these things, is just listening to people all your rattle accolades. stuff off and... You did great. It was absolutely oh, amazing. So thank you did for I that. Did I screw anything up? No, that was all perfect. I loved it. Okay. The elephant in the room. What separates a, say, a, a six star booty from like a one or a one and a quarter star like the, like mine? <laughs> like, is there like, a, is there like a measurement roughly? Uh, it, I would say to get to that six star level, Mm -hmm. You have to be the most well-rounded booty in the game. You Does have that involve to be able exercise? To go above and beyond. Yes, absolutely exercise. And eating uh, correctly, I imagine? Eating correctly does help when it comes to that six star. Okay, all right. I, I think two to maybe two and a quarter is like a reasonable goal for me by the end of the year. But I don't know that where the exercising is at. Okay, before I get to anything, I, so I was, you know, doing research on you, I don't know, it was a week ago, or maybe a little over, and um, I came across the name Donnie Pepper Cricket. And I used to think the name Dandy Chiggins was the best name I'd ever heard until I came across Donnie Pepper Cricket. Are, are you friendly with Donnie Pepper Cricket? Yeah, me and Donnie Pepper Cricket have crossed paths quite a few times. So is, is that not, is that his real, like, like legal name, Pepper Cricket? I, you know what? Oh, I, you can't I, speak on that. I, I don't know if I can speak on that as uh, well as Donnie probably could. Uh, but the first time, first time that I heard that name or read a local independent card and saw that name on it, mm -hmm. I was instantly taken aback. Like Pepper Cricket. That's that's the first time I've ever heard that name. What an interesting like. It caught me right away. And when you see him, you're also taken aback because. He's, yeah. uh, he's quite the guy to look at as well. Totally. So it's one of those things where his name definitely fits his personality. Oh, okay. Yeah, like everyone in my house now is, you know, randomly like saying Johnny Pepper Cricket, you know, or calling <laughs> them like, wow. Um, okay, so what happened first? Uh, dancing, music, or wrestling? Uh, it definitely was dancing for a very long period of time that I uh, spent and made that my sole love. Mm -hmm. And then I slowly transitioned into DJing with dancing. Oh, and wow. now I was finding myself uh, in two different types of entertainment that I was falling in love with. And after, you know, I had taken myself to places I never thought I'd go before when it came to dancing and DJing, mm -hmm. that's when the time in my life switched and I was able to find my next love for performance, which became professional wrestling, which has always been my number one in my heart, to be honest. So did you, did you watch wrestling as a kid? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so it was always was on your radar. Elementary school. Yep. And as far as dance, did you do, did you do hip hop and did you do any other genres? Uh, primarily it's, my favorite thing to do is just to freestyle. I love to be able to put a song on and just let my body do what it does to uh -huh. music. using uh, your musicality and learning and listening to the music to see what you do to it. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, whether it's like the pop and lock or the gliding or I just, I don't know. My body does all kinds of crazy stuff when I just start letting it go. So, but hip hop has always been like my love ever since like the first time I saw something like the movie You Got Served. That's where I first saw that kind of dancing and fell in love with it. Uh, just because I like the style of 
clothing associated with it, the rap music that was associated with it, all that stuff. Did you, um, so do you ever watch um, So You Think You Can Dance? I did. I've watched many seasons of So You Think You Can okay, Dance. Okay, that's I was, because so have I, because my wife is a dancer. Mm -hmm. So I was not exposed to that, like growing up or prior to meeting her. And I said to her almost right away after I started watching the show, I'm like, this is like a lot, this has so much similarity to wrestling. The yeah. footwork, the choreography, the the telling a story through your body and like physical movement, you know. Yeah. Um, so has that like helped you in the uh, ring? I think when it comes to uh, the way my brain thinks when I was a dancer and the way that my brain thinks when I wrestle now, there are uh, correlations between the two. Mm -hmm. I thought my my dance background and my body and the way that I move was really going to help me in the ring. And I think it does now, but when I first started off, I was really hoping that I would like catch on a lot quicker than I did. And yeah, yeah. When it, whenever you just start learning to like throw your body into the mat, your body instantly is like, ah, you know, it, it doesn't know what to do because you're teaching it to safely get hurt essentially. <laughs> yeah, totally. Taking bumps and bruises and, but along the way, I think when it comes to how I move in the ring, uh, once I learn the ins and outs and I continue to work on my footwork and how I get in and out of things, I do think my dance background has helped me out a lot. Okay. And did the the DJing in, the, in, your, in your dancing, did you do this like through, like while you were in uh, college? Yes. Uh, the when I really got into dancing, as far as like something that was more than just like going out with friends and dancing, it became a hobby. There's a group at Iowa State called the Iowa State Hip Hop Club. Okay. Uh, they go by the name Dub H, Double H Hip Hop. Okay. So uh, when I found out about them, I instantly was hooked because I had seen one of their performances and I thought to myself, holy cow, I can learn dancing and there's guys and girls and you get to perform in front of audiences like yeah it was something that i was instantly hooked to and i was somewhat a part of that group and club all the way through college mm -hmm. and when i finished college i still stayed in Ames for a good chunk of years so i was associated with the club for almost eight years um and did you going, do a teaching yes absolutely so i when i first started i was just a dancer mm -hmm. and then uh, I had a friend who decided that they wanted to choreograph, but they didn't feel comfortable uh, doing it themselves. So they asked if I wanted to like co-choreograph a dance. Mm -hmm. and that I thought to myself, I'm like, well, if I don't have to come up with the whole dance, but I just have to implement my ideas into mm -hmm. someone else's stuff. I thought that was good. And once I got to co-choreograph a dance, I fell in love because I realized, oh, I can do this. This is fun because yeah. then you start, um, putting pieces of the puzzle together. And when you watch the final performance and how people react, mm -hmm. you start to learn how to kind of control the crowd with different things that you do in a dance. So that's also where it kind of correlates over into wrestling because you realize what works and what doesn't when it comes to making the crowd, you know, rise up on their feet or fall all the way down. Yeah, yeah. So, did, did, did you think that, um... When you're choreographing a piece, and I've asked my wife this before, and I don't really get a straight answer. What comes first, the setting the the piece or the music? I always have tried to find the song ahead of time. And, okay. And really, every semester when we would start a new dance, I would i would hope that i'd be like flipping through something and something would just jump out at me or mm -hmm. i would go back and i would hear a throwback song that i hadn't heard in so long and my idea for uh the piece that i was going to put together i just realized that some songs uh worked better than others so okay. i always started from my my base level of you usually picking like i don't know maybe three songs Mm -hmm. or one or two songs and then finding a third later and then building uh how i wanted to choreograph the piece or lay the music out after that yeah because in my pea brain it like i i never have understood how like you could 
you could you know set the piece in the in the dance prior and then have music but still the moves hit on certain beats like i yeah. never knew how that matched up but um it sounds like uh having the music to me would be like the first thing yeah um, cause, i mean if you looked at it from like a wrestling aspect uh you would never put uh like you would choose the type of match and then the match would play itself out you wouldn't play out a match and then pick what type of match it was afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've graduated Iowa State, highly um, thought of institution in this country. Um, had you been, by the time you graduated, you know, undergrad, had you ever been inside a wrestling ring before? No, I've been to wrestling shows. Okay. Uh, and before, um, before even coming to uh train at the black and brave wrestling academy mm -hmm. i had only been to one independent show in my entire life oh uh, where i went to high school which is the eagle grove iowa one year at the the summer fair they had wrestling there and it okay. was just like a little show the headlining attraction to get people to go was the bushwhackers were there oh uh they also had like an imposter doink <laughs> but it, w it was one of those things where I was like, oh, man, wrestling's coming to, like, my hometown. This is really cool. Uh -huh. um, but it was just a very small show. Like, when I look back at it, I mean, maybe there was a uh, hundred people there or something of that nature. But it was so cool. And that was probably the closest I'd ever been to a ring because there's no barricades or anything of that nature. Uh -huh. And other than that, it was just live events or Raws or Smackdowns, whichever came to, like, the Des Moines area. Okay. So... Are you, uh, are you have a, re a good relationship with your parents? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So you graduated this highly accredited institution and then you tell your parents that you want to become a pro wrestler. Do they yeah. react positive or negatively to that? Um, I think I'm not necessarily anyone who has ever like done anything, uh, too crazy to make my parents worry. Um, I've only ever been like drunk a handful of times in my entire life. So mm -hmm. I've never been like a big drinker. I've never been a smoker. I've never done any drugs. Um, so I was never one to like make my parents worry in any way, shape or form. Uh, neither one of my parents graduated from any type of college. So I think they thought by the time that I had graduated community college, I had gone on to Iowa State um you know i was working full time i was doing the hip hop club i was graduating from college they knew at that kind of point in my life that i had a pretty good head on my shoulders as far as being able to balance my life and never make them worry because that's kind of always what i'm striving for is i originally wanted to go to college just to make my parents proud because they never got a college degree sure. um so when i graduated i had in mind that you know, maybe I would seek out a job to use that bachelor's degree and, you know, progress and make money and stuff. But mm -hmm. I also feel like there was a part of me that only wanted to go to college just to go to college and do something that my parents never did to show them, look, I'm trying to make you proud. Sure. And even when I was doing it, I was more in love with dance while I was at college than I was with going to school. Um, did you so take when, any courses, dance courses? Never like actual dance courses where I got credit for them. Okay. okay. They did have uh, classes at Iowa State where you could go into the dance program and do things of that nature. But it was all, uh, you know, tap, jazz, ballet. Yeah, modern. Of that nature. And when I look back at it, it would have been really fun to take those classes and get credit for it. But at the same yeah. time, it would have been it wouldn't have been counting towards my major. So I just thought to myself, you know, I'm going to do my hip hop club on the side. I'm going to try to juggle my job and do all these things at once. And even there towards the end, like when I started to figure out the DJing thing, I was making myself way busier than I probably should have been. Uh, but once I was done with it, I was really just hanging on to the dance life really living for the weekends when i dj'd mm -hmm. and then just working just trying to make money i would i didn't necessarily have like 
this place that I was working towards in life. And ultimately my personal life changed drastically. And when Mm -hmm. my personal life did change drastically, I told myself that I'm not getting any younger. I have a really decent body um, that I can work with. And when I went to WrestleMania 31 and I saw Seth Rollins win and cash in the money in the bank, I oh, if had that, the, the I, had that, I had that epiphany moment that there's a gentleman from the state of Iowa in the, this building of or the stadium of 76,000 people and he's from Iowa and he mm-hmm. just won the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. I'm from Iowa. We're both halfway across the country. Why haven't ever I tried this dream of becoming a professional wrestler? And that was the first time that thought of like considering actually doing it came into your head? It it was always one of those things where, yes, I wanted to become a professional wrestler. I had told my family for years and years and years. I just Mm -hmm. never had, I never said that sentence and my family said, absolutely. If that's what you want to do, chase your dreams. It was always like, you know, get get a degree, go to college, like be smart about it. You want to have your fallback, which is, yeah. is really good because a lot of times when you hear wrestlers talk about what people should look for when they become a professional wrestler, there's a lot of very smart people in the business that say, get your college education or get an education in some way, shape or form, because even if you do make it as a professional wrestler, you need something to fall back on because your body doesn't last forever, especially in the world of professional wrestling. Sure. So it's like having insurance yeah exactly in the long run i'm really happy that uh my professional wrestling life happened the way that it did um because i jumped in the game late like people uh like batista and diamond dallas page but people like that give me hope that anything can happen even at an older age when it comes to a dream of professional wrestling i mean look at jericho yeah exactly he's it's fine um so Seth cashes in at WrestleMania. You have this epiphany. What happens the next day? Do you pick up the phone, go on the internet and contact, like looking for uh, trainers? No. So the next day I got to fly back to Iowa. We okay. had to uh, get up and uh, catch our flight because it was like a WrestleMania trip where we were in and out and we, you know, it was, but we were riding that high of WrestleMania the whole way home. Sure. Um, because me and my friend, we'd never experienced that. It was our dream come true right in that moment. Uh, when I came back to Iowa, I think that's where the bug had hit me enough where I needed to start looking. Mm -hmm. I may have even already known in some way, shape or form about the black and gray wrestling Academy, but I think that's where I seriously like looked into the website and, uh, saw the submission process and I sat down one night and just told myself, I go, I'm just going to submit the application um, because the application doesn't cost anything to submit. And at least I can say I did it. And by the next morning, I had already received an email back from Merrick. And once I got that email back saying, we would love to accept you at the Black and Bray Wrestling Academy. That's when I told myself, I go, if one person says that they will train me, and it's from that school, then I have to do this. And that's yeah. where I kind of, I told myself, I go, it's do or die now. You know, so you had to get accepted into the school? Correct, yeah. Anybody who wants to go to the Black and Brave Wrestling Academy, there's an application process that you fill out through the website. And okay. part, of, part of the application process is uh, submitting pictures of yourself to make sure that you're an able-bodied person that can you know, chase professional wrestling. Mm-hmm. You have to write a small essay telling them why you want to become a professional wrestler. Um, and in my essay, I wrote about going to WrestleMania 31 and the moments I'd had and the fact that I'd loved professional wrestling my whole life. And when I got that first email back, you know, I, I couldn't have sent them money fast enough saying, yes, I want to secure my spot for the 2015 class or whatever it was. Yeah. How many people uh, were in that class? Uh, I think when our class started, we might have had 12 people right off the bat. It's usually like 12 to 15. 
Um, but after the first night, usually you have a couple people drop out because the first couple of days are essentially conditioning days. It's like going to boot camp, and the first thing they do is they try to break you. They yeah. put you all the physical stuff to make sure that your body can hold up to this. Are they mean to you? Like say like mean stuff? Um, I mean, nothing like nothing derogatory or anything crazy or that would ever make someone feel uncomfortable about like it wasn't it. inappropriate right exactly um but it's one of those things where if you're told to do an activity and you're carrying a weight or you're doing something and they can tell that you're not trying your hardest or you're resting for too long people uh -huh. get but and there's definitely some people that are a lot you know a lot meaner than others because <laughs> not everybody's meant to become a professional wrestler and some people take it a lot more personal than others so if there's 12 or 15 people running around, usually during those first tests, uh, Colby and Merrick and Matt, they're there watching everyone, mm -hmm. but there's usually a handful of students that are also there helping out as well to make okay. sure that nobody's uh, shaving reps or doing certain things they shouldn't because we want everybody to put, you know, 100% effort from the first day to sure. the last day when it comes to the school. The night before your first day of going to training, are you able to sleep? Are you nervous? Are you confident? Uh, I think I was probably nervous. I was excited nervous. Um, when I knew that my class was getting ready to start, I had already started doing CrossFit ahead of time because I knew that was part of the regimen. So I was getting myself familiar with the fitness that was associated with the school. Um, and I, I can almost guarantee that I worked out the day before or the day even of my class that was going to start because I knew like there's no days off um, and it's probably one of those things where I was just excited. I was ready to go and yeah. I wanted to get things started and uh, at the time the school was over in Moline so okay. they were running the Black and Brave Wrestling Academy out of the CrossFit gym that I was going to. So I could like look over and see things that were happening uh, to the class that was getting ready to graduate. Before. Oh, so uh, like everything that they were doing, it was it wasn't something that I like wasn't ready for. But it's one of those things where once the first night happens, that's when it becomes real for you. Are you black and blue after your first day of training? No, you're definitely sore. Like, okay. Uh, because they they put you through things that you're usually the volume of workout they put your body through mm -hmm. you know? if, unless you're a professional athlete you're not used to going that hard all the time yeah yeah and when you start learning how to do your rolls and your bumps your body is also not accustomed to that mm -hmm. some of the tougher drills up front to make sure that those things aren't going to get to you so when you're taking bump after bump after bump after bump mm -hmm. or when you learn to hit the ropes i think that's when i was the most bruised is when i learned to run the ropes because your body's not ready for that because those ropes are made of cable for the most part they just so have... it's, is it like running into like a i mean not a, a wall like a, you know something really hard is it, it hurts uh it's if you hit the ropes wrong it hurts a lot. If you hit the ropes correctly, your body eventually kind of builds up a callus. It learns to absorb that small amount of punishment, but the faster and harder that you hit the ropes in a controlled manner, mm -hmm. the better your body reacts to it. So, so you do it no problem now, it's like second nature? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, definitely. I think uh, that's one of the things that you see people do a lot is when they get into a wrestling ring, they like to hit the ropes a couple times to see mm -hmm. how uh, tight the ropes are and just to also kind of loosen yourself up and get your footwork going because, you know, you want to know what size of the ring that you're working in too, because like a WWE ring is 20 feet across, but a mm -hmm. lot of rings that you see on independent shows are probably anywhere from 16 to 18 feet across. Mm -hmm. Did, um, at, at what point before your like first match, are, are you working on like a rep repertoire of moves? Like from, like when you're training, so you have uh, something at your first match or? 
usually uh, through the 12 week course of training, they kind of teach you how to become a basic professional wrestler. Uh, you learn your hip toss, your body slam, your arm drag, your back body drop, uh, high cross body block, punches, kicks, forearms, all that stuff. So mm -hmm. you can put together a basic match. You know a couple pins and things of that nature. Usually by the time you start having your matches, that's the stuff you want to focus on anyway, because you want to have a very solid, uh, you want to have a solid background to you. You want to be able to do all the stuff that is the norm when it comes sure. to professional wrestling really well before you start worrying about things like whether you want to do a hurricane rana or anything like that when does that is that a part of like the it's you said it's 12 weeks yeah is there a part of those 12 weeks where you're on the top rope or, you know what i mean or like jumping over the ropes yes uh they teach you how to go over the top rope uh they teach you how to get clotheslined over the top rope they want to make sure that if you're going over the top rope, through the middle rope, things of that nature, that you know how to do it safely. Uh, because they, again, there's a safe way to do just about anything and everything. And it's important to them that you know the rights and wrongs when it comes to uh, having another person's life in your hands. And also knowing how to protect yourself if someone that you're facing does not know how to protect you. So they do go over anything and everything. And there have been a certain couple days, uh, usually in classes where it's, okay, we have 30 minutes left. Does anyone want to learn how to do this move? And if someone goes, yeah, I want to learn how to do a lion salt. Cool. Then if someone knows how to do that, they will help you try to learn how to do it safely uh, by landing on like a crash pad first. And then once you successfully do it a couple times, they'll pull the crash pad out and they're like, okay, now go ahead and hit hit it on a, on the mat. And if you have someone there who's comfortable enough to take it, then they'll go ahead and lay down and take a lion salt. So did when you were um when you were dancing, could you do a flip? Like no uh, I could I could do an okay front flip. Nothing too crazy, but I could do an okay front flip. Just from standing position? uh usually if i can get a step or two like okay. I, I can get over it's nothing uh crazy impressive uh usually i land in like a crouching position i'm not like That's standing fine. completely up uh but yeah that was about as good as i could do i could never do like a nice back tuck or anything of that nature <laughs> so okay when it comes to like your finisher mm -hmm. do you is this something do you choose whatever like whatever you think you want to do as a finisher Yes. Or someone got to tell you you can use that. Um, I think they want you to come up with something that fits your personality and your character. Um, and there was a lot of Booker T influence when I was first starting uh, to figure out who I was because he would do the spin of Rooney. He had very long legs and arms just like I do. Yeah. So I chose to do the scissors kick as my finisher and I've pretty much stuck with that the whole time I've ever been wrestling. Uh, there's been a couple times where I've toyed with the idea of changing it as my character changes, mm -hmm. uh, but I've had very good luck with it. And it's been, there's some times where I hit it and I'm really happy with it. And there's other times I hit it and I go, ah, that one wasn't <laughs> that great, but it's always a learning process because with that one, it's all about the flash and the flare that I yeah, put yeah. on it because all my opponent is doing is bending over. <laughs> That's true. Did, um, did you remember your first match? Yeah, absolutely. And were you, when you were walking out for the first time, did you feel you were ready or did someone tell you you were ready? No, uh, what they used to do is when the classes from the Black and Brave Wrestling Academy would graduate, they would have like a, a, a battle royal for everybody to have their first match in. Oh, cool. Um, so my class, we only had five people graduate. So it was only a five person battle royal. So it wasn't anything. It, it was so small. It was crazy. <laughs> um, and we might have been one of the last classes to do it. There may have been one other one or two other ones after that. But that was my first match was a five person over the top battle royal. It came down to myself and Dante Leone and he hit me with the springboard back elbow to knock me off the ropes. 
so were these like these up it started with 12 people in your class and it ended up with just five yep yep we had a sixth person who made it to like the 10th week of the program and with like two weeks left he ended up dropping out oh god yeah which is crazy because once you put the money down with them it's it's non-refundable and, and he was so not, close yeah it's not like it's a cheap experience and the fact yeah. that he just quit is ridiculous do you um do you enjoy intergender wrestling yeah i don't mind it at all i've had quite a few really entertaining matches yeah with ladies and so when you're in the ring and uh I, I'm ignorant, so like I apologize if these questions sound stupid. But do you consider, like, when you're in the ring and you know you have a female as your opponent, are you thinking of that they're a female, uh, like when you're doing, you know, wrestling them, or you treat them like any other wrestler in the ring? You you're not even thinking about the gender. Um, usually, I don't. I personally don't think about the gender depending on the promotion that I'm working for. If I'm wrestling an intergender match, um, I'm not necessarily in charge of the story mm -hmm. that I'm going to tell that night. Um, I am in charge of making sure that I portray the story the way that it needs to be portrayed. Mm -hmm. So there's been matches I've had with females where, um, I mean, the story of the match is the fact that I'm a big, strong male. They can't do a whole lot to me. Um, and eventually, if I land one single punch on their chin, it's over. Yeah, yeah. Because in real life, if, you know, a guy my size hits a smaller girl one time in the face, it's over. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's the believability of it. But, you know, you can have a little bit of fun when you're out there and make sure that I'm flipping and flying around with some head scissors and things of that nature. I've even, you know, been picked up and uh, had a girl hit hit an AA on me. Again, I'm not falling very far. Yeah, um, yeah. A small girl, but it's fun to like entertain people by letting them see someone do a stunner or a John Cena AA on me. But then by the end of the match, one punch and a scissors <laughs> taking it over. So. What were the circumstances with uh, wrestling Eric Rowan? Um, I was part of the extra talent crew that was, I had followed WWE around that whole weekend. Okay. And went into Monday, which was in Des Moines. They were doing two tapings. They were doing the live taping that aired on 12, 13, um, okay. 12, 12, 16. And then they did the holiday episode, which I believe aired on 1223, I think. Okay. And that's the one that I was part of. Uh, Eric Rowan had two opponents. Uh, funny enough, it was myself on the Christmas episode and Dante Leone, the guy that I just referenced, oh, yeah. that I made my, that beat me in my debut battle uh -huh. royal. He was the week before me. He was on the live episode. So I was lucky enough to be chosen. Um, I was kind of given my instructions for the candy cane uh, gimmick that we were going to use that night uh -huh. as far as trying to persuade Eric Rowan to let me live another day and <laughs> destroyed like all the other opponents. Uh -huh. um, but unfortunately, I got greedy after giving him a candy cane. I said I'd give all the other candy canes to what was in the surprise uh, cage. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That so much. And my candy canes went flying all over the front row when he slid out of the ring and hit me. Was this, is this exciting or like an honor like to, to it, be on that program? Uh, like that, every time you do something in professional wrestling, you always kind of say, oh, it was a dream come true because you uh, thought about that your whole life. It's the same idea of uh, I was signed to any company with the contract at this point. That's a dream come true. But being yeah. on uh, Monday Night Raw, not as an extra, like someone in No Way Jose's conga line, which I have been before, but being oh. someone that was an on-air talent who was in a match that had a graphic show up on the screen with their name, that's a whole new level of, I have TV time. They're trusting yeah. me as a wrestler in my gear to be out here and face against the WWE superstar. 
and whether I'm a WWE superstar or not, there are millions of people across the world who are going to watch this and see me, remember my name, and remember the moment that I had with him. So yeah, it was an honor, a privilege. It was, it flew by, but at the same time, time like stopped when I walked out there with the referee and just got to look around because people in that audience knew me locally uh -huh. and were chanting, you know, JT. Oh, wow. So it was really cool to stop and take a second and look out in the crowd in different directions and see people standing up and waving and trying to get my attention. Is, I, this has never happened to me, but is it a, a great feeling getting cheered or, like, or even booed like by like a bunch of people? Like, yeah. Does it feel good even to this day? Yeah, absolutely. Being able okay. to um, do something that gives a reaction, whether good or bad, creating those moments where it's this this resounding sound of cheers or boos mm -hmm. such a high um that's why you know i love being a heel to do things that stop everyone in their tracks and just shower me with boos because those boos in my head they're essentially just cheers of oh, oh my yeah. gosh you did such a good job being the worst guy in the world totally. um, yes when it comes to going out there and finding a personalized way to essentially play tricks on your mind to make you do what I want when it comes yeah, to being yeah. a professional wrestler. I love that. Wow. All right. I'm, I'm just going to wrap this up shortly. I, I have this question. Is it hard to um, maintain like a, a relationships outside of wrestling? Um, I tend to be an extremely selfish person. Yeah, me too. It gets the best of me a lot of the time. Uh, I think I let the stories of professional wrestling get into my head um, because I've heard way too many times that relationships won't last and you can't balance finding a love for professional wrestling with finding love in life. Yeah. Yeah as i have become a professional wrestler i have opened up and i try to have as healthy a relationship as possible with my girlfriend now at this mm -hmm. point because she knows ultimately what i'm trying to do i have a small time frame to do it so if i can give my best for this time period of my life that as long as i'm conscious every day of making sure that I don't negate my love for her for professional wrestling, mm -hmm. then I can find that balance. I can find those aspects of taking time for me to chase my dreams, but also mm -hmm. making sure that my professional life validates me and makes me just as happy some days as going and wrestling would. Um, and after losing people like uh, John Huber and seeing the outpouring of love mm -hmm. that he had for his wife and children, it shows you that uh, if you can find that balance, that no matter what happens in your career with professional wrestling, you will always be validated every day of your life by having a personal relationship that is ready to ultimately flourish when your professional wrestling career ends. She, was she a wrestling fan prior to your girlfriend before meeting you? She used to watch uh, wrestling when she was younger with her dad. Her favorite wrestler of all time is Sting. Um, oh, that's, well, see, that's awesome that you're dating somebody who's got a favorite wrestler, you know, <laughs> like yeah, kill for when, that. When I, when I first found out that she um, not only loved Sting, but she only knew the Crow version of Sting. She never knew Surfer Sting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so she jumped in when that Monday Night Wars kind of era was happening. But she told me that when she was little, she even went um, for Halloween a Sting one year. And I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that I'm dating someone that at one point was watching WCW Monday Nitro and thought Crow Sting was the coolest thing <laughs> yeah, in the world. Because totally. He loves the movie The Crow. And when a guy shows up on TV and he looks like The Crow, it's like, oh, man, this is cool. That's hilarious. All right, I have a bunch more questions, but we'll need to save that for another day. I don't want to, again, it's Friday evening. 
Can I ask you five random questions? Yes. They're not even wrestling related. Yeah, okay. uh, the, the more random, the better. Oh, very, okay. Have you ever performed the Roger Rabbit just in front of the mirror? Uh, yes, I definitely learned the Roger Rabbit uh, very early on when I joined the hip hop club. Um, and when I learned that there was even a move called the Roger Rabbit, I was like, I didn't even know of this. Oh, but really? I have done the Roger Rabbit a couple times in my life. Uh, not for a long time at this point, but maybe <laughs> uh, during 2021, maybe I'm going to bring it back. Yeah, oh, perfect, perfect. It's classic now. All right, if, if some Nazis offered you $800,000 and asked you to uh, choreograph a piece, would you? <sighs> I, $800,000, but they're Nazis. I feel You wouldn't like, have to do anything like bad. Just choreograph a piece. Maybe there'd be like the goose step in there and oh, <laughs> man, I feel like, I feel like I should definitely not take that money. Tell you or, what, actually, you know what? Maybe I take the money and I choreograph a routine because I'm just choreographing, right? And I take the money and yeah. I donate a huge chunk of the money to uh, some type of uh, Holocaust survivors fund. Oh, there you go. So I'm taking the money from the evil to give to the good. Oh, um, so you got Rob? I'm interviewing Robin Hood, basically. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I'm actually being a heel yeah, to the Nazis, totally. and they don't even realize it. Double agent. Yeah. All right. Have you ever gotten to a fight with an animal? No, I've never fought an animal. Um, I've definitely had to swerve and miss a couple animals with my car. So I think they tried to accidentally fight me on the roads. Um, but no, never a fist fight with an animal. Have you ever, this separate question, have you ever uh, hit like a pet with a closed fist? Uh, no, absolutely Good. not. Good. All right. That's the right answer on that one. I will, ever... I, I will fake super kick my cat. Oh, that's different. And I hate cats, so I wouldn't care if you made contact. But it's I hate them. I'm scared of them. All right. Have you ever choked on ice? Uh, I would say yes. I probably have choked on ice at some point in my life. Okay. And finally, have you ever had someone else's blood in your mouth? Mm. Not like, you know, drinking blood, but like sure. blood splatter? I don't think I've ever been in any matches where someone was bleeding profusely enough where I would have anything crazy like that that was going to happen to me. So I think I've been fortunate enough in my life to be in no blood related incidents when it comes to anything like that. You passed five out of five, 100%. <laughs> um, so 2020s, I think you only wrestled what, like 10, 11, 12 times? Not only, uh, but yeah, I only I only wrestled a handful of matches in 2020 because the year was making us change every single month. It seemed like. Yeah, were you planning like before we even knew about coronavirus? Were you planning on wrestling a lot in 2020 or more than what you end up doing? Absolutely, I think 2020, with all the momentum I had at the end of 2019, when 2020 started off by the time that march came around i thought to myself okay we are really picking things up i have a whole lot of momentum going and some of the shows that were canceled unfortunately were you know opportunities that who knows how long it's going to take to get back but yeah imagine i have a feeling that when normal or our new normal yeah finds a way to pick up momentum and steam that a lot of those opportunities will find a way to come back around and I'll be ready for them when they do. So is it hard to book anything for 2021 at this point? Um, I wouldn't say it's it's hard to book it, but I also think you have to be smarter about anything that you're taking uh, when it comes to a booking because not only do you want to still find a way to make wrestling a regular thing that's happening so you don't have a lot of ring rust and mm -hmm. you know, you're getting out there but you also want to make sure that you're taking all the precautions necessary in today's day and age with covid and making sure that not only you're staying safe but all the people that you're working with are staying safe as well 
Got it. Well, JT, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I again, it's, it, I don't want to keep you terribly long, so hopefully you'll want to come back on for like a part two. Um, yeah. But uh, again, it was great having you on. Um, hope you had. Did you have a nice New Year's Eve? Uh, yesterday was a very normal day when it comes to me. Uh, like I said, since I'm not much of uh, a party or, or a drinker uh -huh. like that, you know, we, I think me and my girlfriend were in bed by 10 o'clock or whatever it was. So I just let my phone roll over into 2021 and I woke up nice and rested. Yeah. It was just another day. Exactly. Every, every day in 2020 has seemed like a Tuesday to me anyways. So yeah. like, yeah, I was in bed at 10 15 last night. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, have a happy and healthy new year. Um, I will be following you for the next few months to see where you go. And hopefully then you'll come back on and we can talk some more. Absolutely. I can't wait to do a part two in 2021. Yeah, seriously. All right. Take care, JT. It was awesome. a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye.